very well. Say it very well. Brothers and sisters, there is the real baptism in the Holy Ghost that gets the work done. The Holy Ghost knows how to get the job done. And it's important to make sure that that experience is real, is current. And that experience will help to get the work done. Look at this. We've read about our Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And then I wanted to see this. Look at this in Romans. And uh, in Romans, you'll see what the word of the Lord tells us. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. In Romans chapter 15, I wanted to see from verse 15. Romans 15. And in Romans chapter 15 from verse 19, let's look at verse 19. Verse 19 tells us very quickly. It says, through mighty signs and wonders. Somebody say mighty signs and wonders. By the power of the Spirit. Somebody say by the power of the Spirit. Did you see that? Through mighty signs and wonders. By the power of the Spirit of God. So that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And so it's important to note that. And so it's important to understand that the Spirit's power is very important. Now, every great accomplishment is at the cost of great commitment. Every great accomplishment is at the, at the cost of great commitment. The Lord wants us to understand that because you see to preach effectively requires some things uh, and uh, the first thing I want to say here is this simplify your life simplify your life simplify your life you see if you're going to preach powerfully you cannot be here and there and here and there and here and die to have the power that's a price to pay there is a cost for this. And so we simplify our lives so that we can really do the work. The other thing that will help us before we get into uh, some of the practical uh, parts, uh, uh, sections, uh, we've got to be prayerful. The, the, the altar of prayer is the place where we receive help. It says, come ye, let us uh, we come boldly to the throne of grace, that you may find grace, uh, that you may find, uh, uh, you may be able to obtain mercy and find grace to help, grace to help in the, uh, and grace to help. And then he also says here, he says, I haven't obtained help from God. Apostle Paul saying that, I have continued until this day. And so prayer is important. We cannot, we are trying to get men, move them on the side of God. We're not winning them with psychology. We're not winning them with philosophy. If, we're go if people are going to truly repent and have a change of heart, it's by the foolishness of the preaching of the gospel. But it's the preaching that is backed by the word of God. The other thing we must remember is that we must be studious. You see, when you think about Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul was a man that really studied. And uh, he was the one that said, study to show yourself approved unto God. You've got to study to be approved. And you've got to really prepare and spend time preparing for the message. Many people don't do that. Uh, they just want to spend a few minutes and then go and, and give a message. And they wonder why the message will not have impact. You see, God understands where maybe you're just called, uh, uh, given a short notice. But when he knows you've had a long day, when he knows you have an entire week to prepare for next Sunday, and you're just uh, just 10 minutes before the time, God give me, God give me, God give me. And you'll be, you wonder what is going to happen. Because if you don't feed the people well, the people will not grow and they will not want to come back. It's as you feed people well, then they can grow and be all that God wants them to be. In fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, uh, as you see what that uh, what we have there, it says uh, it, in verse 15, why don't we look at that, Second Timothy, and see the word of the Lord. Second Timothy chapter 2, what verse? I hope I didn't hear chapter 15. Verse 15, thank you. Study to show yourself approved unto God. And then a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God truth and the lord will help us to make the time to study in jesus name you see what we make what we help as we study is to be excited to see revelation when you're excited to see revelation it makes it takes boredom out of study you know that you're getting to the word and you're expecting somebody say expecting 
Say it one more time. Say it one more time. Whenever you go to God expecting, it will not disappoint. You are studying because you are on a fact-finding mission. You are on a mission to get something that you can feed the people of God with. Then God is able to channel it to you. Because the Holy Ghost knows the hearts of the people that are coming. He knows their situations. He knows their conditions. And it's not uh, just by picking this, picking that, that will help. But when we rely on the Holy Ghost by studying, then, and we're excited, it will open our eyes. Don't we see at, uh, from scriptures, open my eyes to behold what? Wondrous things out of your word, out of your law. You pray that, now go and begin to behold. It's not enough to pray. Open my eyes. Now go and begin to do what? Behold. Now, so it's important for us to, to keep that in mind. As we think about a message in itself, uh, there is, uh, uh, there is the, the title of the message. And uh, now I'm going to some practical details. Uh, the, the, your, your message should have a title. And uh, it comes out of the topic. The topic that the Lord has played, uh, laid on your mind. And how we, how we structure our title is important. Uh, there are people that, uh, you see, a lot of time can actually be, can be spent just trying to make sure your title is right. Because you want your title to, to, to be inviting. You want your title to break the highs, as it were. You want the title to be something that people want to continue to hear. You want to sustain the interest from the beginning to the very end that people are alive and awake. You want it to be such that that's the best thing going on in the room at that time. That people are at full attention. So it's important to have a title. And uh, it may just be that you're asking an interesting question. For example, where are the dead? Where are the dead? That begins to get somebody to think. And so there are things we can do as we think about a question. It could be a common phrase. Uh, for example, talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. We know that as a common phrase, but then you know what, you, what you're driving at. And uh, different things that we can leverage. It could be an interesting topic. A, a new height with the most eye. And there are different things that we can leverage for the title. I'll go to the introduction. The introduction of the message is also important. Remember that you want to sustain the interest from the very beginning to the very end. And so it's important to make sure that we introduce the message with the goal of making sure that the interest of the people uh, is sustained. And as we introduce the, the, bring the introduction, we're also thinking and mindful of the time. Because, you see, even on, on, for online, it's been uh, discovered that people online, uh, they, that you have between 7 minutes and 75 minutes to sustain their interest. And the 75 minutes is at the high end if the online package is well curated, if it's well done. If it's not well done, people tune out and tune off. And so it's important to keep that in mind. Then I go to the, the, uh, the sermon itself, the body of the sermon. As we think about the sermon, we must remember our audience. We don't want to speak above their edge. We want to understand their level of understanding because uh, even Jesus, the Bible says, and the common people had him how? Gladly, gladly. The ordinary people, they could understand what he was saying. And so we, we, and Jesus could have used examples, esoteric examples, examples about heaven, examples about many, many things that people will not understand. But he chose to speak very simply. He used illustrations, parables. He made it very simple for the people to understand. And the same thing, we want to make sure that we do. You can re easily see that it takes time to prepare a, 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 an effective message. It takes time. It's not just that something that you just come up and then you look at even old notes. You bring the old notes and then the Spirit of God on a fact-finding mission with a desire to be ex we're excited for God to give you fresh insight. And you look at it, you might discover your old notes. You wonder why you said that in the first place because you have grown. I shouldn't have said this this way. Now I know better. And then something fresh coming from the old notes. That's what God wants us to do. And so as we keep that in mind, we know our audience, we know the purpose for the message, and we choose acceptable words. We choose what? Acceptable words. The words that we use must be acceptable. And of course, it's got to be scriptural. As we keep all these to mind, the Lord will help us to be able to communicate effectively in Jesus' name. 
I can't hear your amen loud enough. Now, and of course, there are different, in your body of your message, you can have a few points, but the goal is to make sure that there is a flow. Somebody say there is a flow. And there is continuity. Somebody say continuity. So that somebody can, people can follow you as you're giving. You're taking them on a journey. Somebody say a journey. You're starting from somewhere and you're ending somewhere. You don't want it to be disjointed. It's like you have a map of somewhere you're going. And you're just going in circles and you're going. It's, people are going to get confused. You start and then you're taking them on a journey. And on a journey. And on a journey. Until you finally get to conclusion. The Lord will help us in Jesus name. We must make sure that we have order. Order in our message so that it flows, you know. Order increases, uh, order brings increase. Order brings what? Uh, you know, let's say as you're coming for this program now, you took your box. If you didn't fold your, 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 your clothes and you just dump them, you'll see that you will not maximize the space. But if you fold your, your clothes and you put them well, you'll discover that there will still be what? You can put more. Isn't that the case? Because order leads to increase. And uh, when you look at nations that, are, that do not have order, those are the poorest nations. Isn't it in the world today? And, but when you have order, it leads to what? Increase. And so let's have order and there will be increase in Jesus' name. I said there will be increase in Jesus' name. We want to engage our listeners. And as we engage them, we can leverage facts, we can leverage stats, we can also leverage humor. There are times we just bring humor. You know, God has a sense of humor. How many of us realize that God laughs? You read Psalm, I was doing my quiet time this morning, and I was reading in Psalm 37 again, God laughs. And then in Psalm 2, God, you see, and the Bible says rejoice evermore. Again, I say what? Rejoice. And so bring things that... People that have carried a lot of burden and they came to church on Sunday, they are, by the time they go home, they have all their burdens forgotten. And they are renewed and refreshed to conquer for the week. And then they look forward to another Sunday. They say, I can't wait for Sunday to come again. I can't wait. That's what will keep the church moving and keep the church growing. And the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. I said, The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. The church must meet the needs of the people. Very important. It's important. The sheep will go to the grass that is green. Green pasture. And as ministers, we must ensure that we create green pastures. We prepare a rich menu from heaven. And deliver to the people. And the people can tell when the minister is prepared as well. And God can tell. And God is not going to bless a mess. And so, let's get ourselves ready. The final point, and then we will pray. Uh, uh, the final point here, as we think about these, uh, the final thing that I, I want to share with us is possibilities. Somebody say possibilities. Possibilities through effective preaching in an evolving world. Of course, we've looked at the different components of your message, including conclusion. Uh, the conclusion is important. And you want the conclusion to lead them to a decision. Those who have not been born again, you want them to be born again. Uh, and there's a way you can so package the message that people that have not been born again will be touched in their heart. And they want to give their lives unto Christ. And so you make the conclusion, you package it well. And you make it such that it's memorable. Somebody's leaving the church all through the week, they can't forget it. They can't forget it. They can't forget it. They can't forget it. It takes work to prepare effectively. Final point. Now, when we preach our message, preach your message well. And people will be eager to come next time. When you hear good preaching, you know it. I said when you hear good preaching, you do what? You know it. Just like when you go, you've had a nice meal. Don't you know it? When you've gone to a, a, an excellent restaurant and you've had a nice meal, don't you know it? You know it. And people know when they have been well fed. Jesus said, feed my sheep, feed my lamb. And we must keep the grass green and the sheep will come for it. Keep the grass green and what will happen? It makes me to lie down in green pastures. The church will enjoy it. And then you're profiting will appear unto all. As one person comes, 
and he likes it, he stays. And then he invites another person, another person stays. Before you know it, what happens? Little by little, a church of 10 will become 25. A church of 25 will become 50. A church of 50 will become 80. A church of 80, 100. Little by little, but it's sustained growth. That growth is sustained. And the people are being fed. And those are the people that will also reach out to others that something is happening here. Fire is burning and is a holy fire. And the people will be blessed in Jesus' name. In uh, Acts chapter 14, and then we'll pray. Acts chapter 14. In Acts chapter 14, and I'm going to read here uh, in verse 1. Acts chapter 14. What verse? Okay, I didn't say the verse, did I? I said verse 1, thank you. So, verse 1, verse 1. Acts chapter 14, verse 1. You see, you ask questions like that to see if people are awake. Acts chapter 14, verse 1. And it came to pass. Somebody say, and it came to pass. And it's coming to pass in our ministries in Jesus' name. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so speak. Somebody say, so speak. Say it one more time. Say it one more time. This is effective preaching. It's so preached powerfully. It's so spoke powerfully. What happened? That a great multitude. Somebody say great multitude. Now, let that continue to come out of your mouth. You see, don't look at your church as small. Cut it out of your mouth. Uh, don't ever say that. What do you see? A great multitude. What you confess, you possess. Very important. Very important. Very important. Jesus said in, it's in Mark eleven twenty two. have faith in God. Verse 23. For verily I say unto you, if you will speak to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And then he says, you will have whatsoever he saith. Very important. He so speak that a great multitude, both of the Jews and of the Gentile, of the Greeks, did what? Believed. God wants us to so speak. We become the mouthpiece of God. We become the, the mouthpiece of God. And as we go there, the word will make impact in Jesus' name. I want you to rise up on your feet. And we're going to pray. And we're going to really declare. I want you to declare over your ministry. Declare over your life. Declare over your location. Declare, declare, declare. Lord, a shift in preaching. Lord, a shift, a shift, a shift, a shift. Effective preaching over my life. As they so speak, Lord, help me to so speak. As they so speak, Lord, help me to so speak. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me to pay the price. That's the price. There is a price. There is a price. There is a price. There is a price. Is there a goal? Is there a purpose in your heart? Or are you satisfied with where you are? There is, there is a new height to get to. There are new levels to scale. God wants us, wants to take the ministry to a greater height. We need the preaching. And we need effective preaching in this evolving world. As the world is changing, as the world is evolving, we need people that will so speak. We need people that will so speak. Yes, the anointing is there, but they organize their lives and organize themselves so that the word of the Lord will bring impact. The word of the Lord will bring result. The word of the Lord. Pray for yourself so that when you go back, something new will begin to happen. When you go back, they will know that you have encountered God. And a colorful destiny is available. Oh Lord, that they will know you have encountered God. You have met with the Most High. You have encountered God at the pastor's retreat. And your preaching comes with power and with fire. Fire power. The power of the Holy Ghost. That will help people to know the Lord. That will lead them to conversion. That will lead them to restitution. That will lead them to sanctification and holiness. That will lead them into a deeper walk with God. And into a change of life. In Jesus mighty name we are praying. In Jesus mighty name we are praying. Now I want an amen like a mighty army. Father in the name of Jesus.
us. We know that you have brought us here for a shift. We know you have brought us here to scale new heights. We know you have brought us here to move to higher dimensions. Lord, I pray that the fire, the firepower, and all that we need to succeed in our preaching ministry, you grant unto us in Jesus' name. I ask that you will do something new in every life, something new in every ministry, and give your people a colorful destiny in Jesus' name. Now we see the great crowd, and we welcome them into all our locations in Jesus' name. We give you the praise because we know you have answered. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we are praying. And the people of God said, Praise the Lord. Let's put our hands together for Jesus. That was a powerful ministration. Praise the Lord. Do you like the illustration of the fish in the fry pan? Oh my goodness, that was a good one. If you miss it, ask somebody, they will tell you. Praise the Lord. We are going to the next uh, topic. So without wasting time, I want to call our pastor, our resident pastor, Pastor Charles, to come up here and bless us with his ministration. Praise the Lord. Let us, please us, let us stand up. Let us start committing ourselves into the hand of the Lord as he's come up, that the Lord will do something through him as well. And we are not here just in vain. We will be blessed before we leave this place in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Father, we are praying that you will give us the mindset of community. Show us what we can do for our communities. Help us to be givers. Not just being bogged with the attitude of uh, growing the church primarily, set up, I mean, being fixated on just enlarging our numbers. But we ask, oh God, you will change our orientation so I can be more thoughtful about what we can do for our communities. And we know when we do the right thing, it will precipitate results. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise the Lord. Please be seated for a moment. Come with me to Mark chapter 1 verse 37. Mark chapter 1 verse 37. We're about to get into a subject which is like the dirty job in ministry. Somebody has to do this job. Somebody has to go into the community and get the work done. Somebody has to go and get the fish out of the river, killed and, and bring the fish into where it is processed. Mark chapter 1 verse 37. We read together. Let's read together so that we can be alive uh, to the sermon. Let's read together, everybody. Verse 37. And when they had found him, they said unto him, What? All men seek for. And he said unto them, The response is so very, very, very poor. Are we all there? Or oh, I should wait for you? Okay. A few more seconds. Mark chapter 1, verse 37. Can we read together again? And when they had what? Found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. And he preached in their synagogues with, throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. Because of time, I won't read for that. You know, only God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. However, if you look at the ministry of Jesus in the human form, he showed us how to evolve, praise the Lord, in order to reach our communities. He, of course, sought to fulfill the unfinished task, and he made conscious effort to reach his community. He sought for people who were not like him, who were not of his tribe. His message, his desire was to liberate. Liberate people in his community from satanic power and tyranny. 
and uh, he was not like I said in my prayers or the prayers I led us he was not fixated on building like growing the church to a massive uh, some massive number although from the communities he extracted people who later on became his disciples and, uh, and we're gonna be looking at some of this as within the limited time that we uh, have I want to make us understand I want us to understand that community outreach is much more about what you can do for your community than what the community can do for you as we go through this subject I want you to reflect reflect what's your vision for your community what are you hoping to achieve reflect on what you want the church to become your local church now to become as you go into the community to reach out to people are you thinking about having a diverse church or just a church of people that look like you what's your vision for reaching people with diverse from diverse culture what's your vision for reaching Africans perhaps Hispanics Caucasian if you look at our statistics you can tell that we are underperforming when it comes to you reaching the African community if you look at the uh, African community in the United States of America we are not even measuring up so there has to be something wrong with our strategy so we can't say the issue is with reaching Caucasians but even the African community we are not even reaching them but I'm praying and trusting the Lord that as we evolve, the Lord will do something in our lives in Jesus' name. You know, I said to you that, uh, yes, God is the same yesterday, today, and uh, forever. But in the human form, I'm going to show you scriptures that Jesus evolved in the human form to show us the need to evolve, to evolve I mean to say, as people who preach the gospel and carry the good news. Let's look at the first point. Snapshot of community outreach through the ministry of Jesus. First point, snapshot of community outreach through the ministry of Jesus. And I'll just go on, and let's talk about the first point, snapshot. We want to see what community outreach is about as in the ministry of Jesus. Let's look at John chapter 4, verse 34. Turn with me to John chapter 4, verse 34. The book of John 4, 34. Jesus said, Unto them I meet is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. My meat is to do the will of him who has sent me and to finish his work we also look at math Matthew chapter 9 verse 35 Matthew 9 verse 35 the Bible says here Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people can we just say that Jesus went into his community he went into the hideouts the hiding places for drug addicts perhaps can we just say Jesus knew the sort of community the composition of his community he knew where the joints were he knew the hangouts for drug addicts he knew where the, uh, the homosexuals congregate and so on and so forth he had a good mapping of his community. Many of us, including myself, if we're really going to reach our community, apart from understanding our own selves and who we are and what we can do for God, there is a need for us to understand our community. There's a need for us to understand the location of people, the location of the needy, people who need to be helped. And I will give us practical uh, things, practical things that we've done here in the United, uh, sorry, the United States of America. Here in, the, in D.C., of course, the United States of America, over the years, some were very, very, uh, many of them were very, very productive and useful to the church. Praise the Lord. Let's look at Mark chapter 1, verse 37 again. And when they had found him, they said unto him, all men seek for thee. Jesus literally went to the community to do exploits. And for every point of contact, or for every point of call, it's like there were people trailing him, following him, following him around. And so there were a stream of people just 
following Jesus. What made Jesus unique? What made him a good community leader? For every community outreach, successful or will be successful community outreach, there has to be a, an effective community leader. I'm going to talk to you more about what community leadership is about. The Bible says here, and he said unto them, let us go into the next towns. He wasn't even satisfied with this exploit. In one point, he said, let's go into the next towns, uh, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth, and he preached in the synagogues throughout all Galilee, and cast out devils. Looking at a snapshot of community outreach through the ministry of Jesus, we see that Jesus had ministry, a synagogue outreach, a synagogue outreach. He had an outreach to the synagogue. Remember, in those days, synagogues, that's where the Jewish people congregated. They would congregate in the synagogue. And so Jesus was very, very interested in reaching out to people at the synagogue. The New Testament, uh, Testament records more than 10 occasions on which the ministry of Jesus took place in the synagogue. So he had this, at the synagogue, he engaged people. The synagogue, he meant to be a place of prayer, a place of worship place of sharing God's word. Uh, during the Sabbath days, people will gather at the synagogue and they worship God and they pray and do sacred things. But off Sabbath days, the synagogue was uh, like a civic center. And so Jesus was not only at the synagogue on Sabbath days, but he was also at the synagogue off Sabbath days because people will use the synagogue for other activities like school, like courtyard, a place where people will gather. Jesus was at a local synagogue. Let's look at Matthew chapter five, uh, 4 verse 23. Matthew 4 verse 23. Matthew chapter 4 verse 23. The Bible says that Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Can you read with me verse uh, 24 everybody? 24. And his fame did what? Went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with the devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. There are certain categories of people that you will never get in within the uh, four walls of a church. You never get them within the organized settings because uh, in the first place you are too decent for such categories of people they won't even stay with uh, within your congregation uh, from the doorpost they will even turn back when they see how well dressed you are how organized you are how you know educated perhaps you are and so on and so forth. And so to be able to reach such people, you have to roll your sleeves up. You have to get into the community and meet them at the points of their needs. Jesus healed. You know, at the synagogue, Jesus debated the people. He actually engaged in debates. I will not permit me to read all the scriptures. But you can write this down. You can look at this later. John chapter 6, verse 28 to 59. Not only did he heal, he engaged in debates. You know, engage people, conversations. We see that from all that Jesus did, let's look at uh, John chapter 2, verse 13. John chapter 2, verse 13. John chapter 2, I read verse 13. John chapter 2, verse 13. The Bible says here, and the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. There were major synagogues, like the one at Jerusalem, those Jesus will attend when there were special events because at those places he will meet with important people. And so Jesus will visit the, uh, the synagogue during Passover for festivals. He will, I mean, the Jewish festival, like the Hanukkah festival, which they still celebrate today. Jesus will make himself available at those places. And at those places, at the synagogue, during the special festivities, Jesus will perform wonders. He dealt, he healed the unclean, he cleansed the unclean. He interacted, of course, he delivered, he saved the adulterers, he 
healed the blind, he made the blind to see, he made the lame to walk. Basically, he met people that had needs. Today, uh, synagogue or the synagogue of those days is today synonymous to synonymous to churches for believers. The synagogue that was at the time of Jesus for believers is like our church settings. But the synagogue for unbelievers is still much more like the civic centers, the community centers, where they play basketball, where they meet for their, uh, what do you call that, for selling goods and, and so on and so forth. And so there's a need for us to meet them at these civic centers, at the parks, at the malls, at the prisons, at the hospitals, wherever they be gathered. Let's turn to Luke chapter 21, verse 37. Luke chapter 21, I read verse 37. And in the daytime he was teaching in the temple, and at night he went out and abode, abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. In the Mount of Olives. So let's also read Luke chapter 19, verse 47. Luke 19, 47. Luke 19, verse 47. And in the daytime he was teaching in the temple, and at night he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of, of Olives. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Not only did Jesus engage people at the synagogue, Jesus actually had social hangouts with sinners. Can I hear where it says social hangouts with sinners? He hung out with the unbelievers to the extent that they called him the friend of sinners. Praise the Lord. Let's look at Matthew chapter 9 verse 10. Matthew chapter 9 verse 10. Matthew 9 verse 10. We're looking at the things that Jesus did, snapshot, as far as community service, as to what Jesus did. And so we can take a cue from what Jesus did and apply that to our ministries and relax a little bit. Relax ourselves to do the work of God, get down to earth, get down to the community and do the dirty job. Matthew 9 verse 10, and it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans, can I hear where I say many publicans? And sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Verse 12, read with me, verse 12, everybody. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. Is somebody here ready to learn? I, I don't seem to be, I, I, I thought, or maybe you're looking for, I'm not going to be some assaulting here for you to follow up with what I'm saying, but I believe I'm speaking to a mature audience here. I say, somebody on the grasp, have a grasp of what Jesus is saying here. They will understand what Jesus is saying. That go in and do what? And reproduce the same scenario. And do what? Emulate what he has done. Praise the Lord. He said, they that be old not a physician. We're talking about community outreach. The dirty germ. But they that are sick, but go here and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous or sinners to repentance. Matthew chapter 11 verse 16. Matthew chapter 11 verse 16. But where unto shall I like in this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets. The children sitting in the markets. They're like children sitting in the market, not in the church, between the church wall. Not people, you know, like as we are sitting here. They're like children sitting in the marketplace, rowdy places, praise the Lord, and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. Now, I said to you that, yes, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But in the human form, he evolved. Listen to this. For John came neither eating nor drinking. But Jesus didn't come neither eating nor drinking. <laughs> what did he do? Of course, the people said he had a devil. Verse 19, the evolving leader. Can I hear where I say the evolving leader? Let's read together verse 19. The son of man came eating and drinking. So what do you say? What will you say Jesus is doing here? He is evolving. He is not trying to be like John. He is not trying to be like the general superintendent, perhaps, 
He is not trying to be like that minister. He is not trying to be like that other person. But Jesus, we see here, came eating and drinking. And they say, behold, a man glutinous and a wine by a a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. You know, I pray the Lord will give us wisdom and understanding in Jesus' name. Mark chapter 2, verse 15. Mark chapter 2, I read verse 15. Mark chapter 2. Let's look at Mark 2, verse 15. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? We see here social hangout. Can I hear us say social hangout? Many of us are anti-social. That's the truth of the matter. You don't even socialize with your children, let alone socialize with a, a, a greater community. <laughs> Praise the Lord. They call for events at school, you never even show up. Uh, parents teachers association meeting you don't show up sports in the community you don't show up they're having some festival you don't show up and, uh, and actually many of you have actually jettisoned and cut off a link with community or community community meetings thanks be to God because of uh, the church had a reason for that to get us out of the world and now you're out of the world you've abandoned your community you've abandoned your, your, your villages You've abandoned your people. They call for projects. You don't even participate. And uh, you want to reach them? How are you going to reach them? They're trying to uh, have ball holes in the villages. You don't participate. And let's leave village people alone. Now let's come to our immediate community. So the, the point I'm making, Jesus did not extract himself from the community. Jesus was part of a community. Can I hear you say to your neighbor, be part of your community? He dined with sinners. He dined with publicans. And the Bible said here that, you know, do you know why Jesus did that? He, his goal was to reach them. His goal was to win them. And so he had to be engaged. I pray that the Lord will help us. We get engaged in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 5, verse 29. Luke 5, 29. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and others that sat down with them. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? It's not logical. It's not, it doesn't look right. It doesn't meet the eye. Why do you sit? and drink with publicans and sinners. And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That was why he was dining with them, to call them to repentance. And they said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise the disciples of the Pharisees. But your own, you like food, 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 food. You know, we've tried many things. I know many of you have tried many things. That will not permit me to go into those details to ask you what you've tried in your church. Sometimes some of you have organized, how you have food during service. If you go to a typical American uh, spare setup, some of them have uh, food in between service. During the service, they have like uh, breakout sessions. They have after such scriptures. People go refresh themselves and come back for the other phase of service. They have a reason for, for doing what they do, what they're doing. But whatever will help you to reach your community, do it. Can I, turn to you? Can I hear you say to your neighbor, whatever will help you reach your community, do it. They even called him a glutinous man. He likes food. A wine biber. Well, many of you will talk about wine, but this, you know Jesus will not, is not going to take uh, alcoholic wine. They say he's a wine biber. And a friend of publicans and sinners. Now let's move on to hanging out with the Samaritan woman. I won't elaborate so much about that. You all, all know that story very well. That Jesus hung out with the Samaritan woman at a town in Samaria. What was Jesus looking for in Samaria? 
not the normal place you find Jesus. And this was during his return from a trip. He hung out with the Samaritan woman by the well to the extent of extracting information and actually helping the woman out, all out of her situation. Jesus was a friend indeed of sinners. Praise the Lord. The question is this. If Jesus was to be here today, would he do these things all over again? Can I hear a response from you? I didn't hear you very well. Will Jesus do this? I, I honestly, deep down within myself, believe that Jesus is going to do the same thing all over again to prove some of us wrong, that our churches are not growing, and it doesn't seem, but I believe we're ready for growth. I, I believe we're ready for the next level. And I am trusting the Lord there will be a change of attitude, a change of orientation. Now, our pastor uh, told us about Peter, you know, how God had to deal with Peter to get Peter out of his shell, out of his uh, stigmatization and out of his stereotyping of people. God had to actually, through a revelation, do that. Jesus will hang out with the poor. Jesus will hang out with destitute if he was to be here again. In the human form, remember he evolved, not doing things like John the Baptist. Now this was Jesus doing his own thing to reach the sinners. Jesus will hang out with prostitutes. Jesus will hang out with the gay. He will hang out with lesbians. Jesus will hang out with the adulterers and thieves. Jesus will hang out with the sinners. He will. And I want to share this with you. And I think those who are in my church out there, probably going to be hearing this for the first time. I say, uh, teacher, you know, I always have that open door policy for students to share with me. I mean, people in my community, academic community, to share. I talk about the academic work, but if you venture into uh, other things, like emotional things, then I will be there waiting for you. And uh, one of the, those days, uh, one of my students, who was supposed to be a lesbian, said, I want to come and visit your church. And this was all the way from uh, Eastern Shore, two and a half hours. You know, I knew who she was, but I wasn't going to tell my, you know, my members. I wasn't going to tell anybody. I didn't even tell any of the leaders. I just wanted her to come and hear the word of God. And she came in for service that day. And she, and lo and behold, the message that day, the Sanskrit scripture that day was on a uh, man, husband, and uh, marriage between a man and a, and a woman. And the Sanskrit scripture teacher did an excellent job. Oh, I was impressed with Pastor Emade that day. He's just hearing that for the first time. He was the one handling Sanskrit scripture that day. And he broke down that subject. Deep down within myself, I was praising God that she was there for service that day. He ministered without knowing. He was ministering as orchestrated by God to meet a need, to meet, to emphasize on something that I had been praying to God for, for this individual. And if I told him that uh, this type of person was uh, coming into the church, <laughs> maybe he would have been more personal in his uh, sermon, like some of us do today, that uh, the moment you find somebody in, of that uh, situation, then that becomes your sermon for that day. But he didn't know. He was ministering as led by the Spirit of God. Why don't I tell the church members? Because if they get to know that that person is actually not like them, you, you know what's going to happen. Oh, they're going to make all their children to, to keep some distance so it will be contagious. Uh, they, uh, I'm sure that uh, they are going to try to create a, a, a buffer zone around that individual. But uh, thanks be to God. Can somebody say thanks be to God? God got the job done. Wherever she is today, the important thing was that she had the word she came. We're talking about how to, you know, how to basically come out of our comfort zones and come out from our idea how we want to see things. The truth of the matter is the popular, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God is not going to allow anyone without engaging them go just to hell. Not even the thief on the cross. No. Despite all that he, he had done, God is not going to allow Satan just take people. A open hell, expand hell to accommodate people. He is going to engage them. He is going to you know, many years ago, we, like I said, you need to know your community. We have been here for several years, several years, serving the Lord wonderfully to God be the glory. But suddenly, I mean, have to ask, there could be something much more than what the, the ministry work within the four walls of the church. 
lo and behold, the moment I had that desire, God opened my eyes to realize that there was a boy's town right next to the church. Boy's town, Washington, D.C., uh, a home for boys abused, abused boys. And I shared with our uh, regional overseer, praise be to God, I had his backing. Do you know, uh, we went there, not minding what, what it was going to be. I'm, I'm not American, you can tell I'm not eloquent. But it's just about just having the mindset of meeting the community at the point of their need. And I went there and I called one of the brothers and said, this, I need a company to go to these people. And of course, when we got there, I told them why we were there. That we wanted to have a Bible study with the boys. Boys in the age bracket of 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And uh, as God will have it, you know, the first Bible study, all the officials were there wondering what was going to become of what we were going to do. And they all stood, a second Bible study, a third Bible study, because they were ready to cut it short. If it was not going to excite, if it wasn't going to be engaging for the boys, do you know we spent a whole solid one year, one solid year running a Bible study at the boys' town of Washington, D.C. And, uh, you know, I, I felt that if they were not going to come to a church, if they won't come here, but I mean, I think someone has to meet them at the place of their needs. And I, you don't want to hear the sort of questions, the sort of questions these boys were asking. Oh, deep, 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 deep questions. But we just shared with them the love of Christ. The ministry, of course, uh, work there ended. And after I told them, uh, well, I'm being posted to another part of the city and uh, I have to go elsewhere. It's too far away from here. And they say, when are you coming next? When are you coming next, please? They were actually looking for me to continue the Bible study with them. Can I hear us say community outreach? I pray the Lord will give us understanding in Jesus' name. Jesus was at the seaside. He was uh, even at times uh, in the sheep, cruise ship, ministering the word. And you can see even Paul we engage people during, uh, well, Paul was like a millennial pastor. He actually engaged the people even during religious festivals. If you uh, look at uh, Colossians 2, verse 16, he engaged Greek philosoph philosophers, I mean to say, in Ad Athens, uh, you know, and uh, he engaged them in, in, in debates and uh, just for the purpose of reaching them. I pray the Lord will help us. We'll be community leaders indeed in Jesus' name. Quickly, I want to go to uh, the second point, strongholds obstructing community outreach. And I think I'll be done with this in two minutes. Strongholds obstructing community outreach. You know, one of uh, the writers of the church actually put this down this way. Lead, L-E-A-D. If you write L-E-A-D, for it's vertical, lead. It says, one of the strongholds obstructing community outreach is leadership problem. Can I hear where it's a leadership problem? The, the E represents exposure problem. Exposure. Can I hear say exposure? You know, the truth of the matter is that many of us are not exposed. And uh, many of our leaders have been talking about this. We're not really, really exposed to people of other culture. And many of us cannot actually engage people in debate without getting angry. And actually, some of you, your place of, place of work, who, who, those of you who are into marketing, sometimes I see that even in the Christian dog. You find a believer, perhaps he's into, he's uh, into what you who, who uh, sell houses, people, real estate. A fellow believer has said, "Look for a house for me," and suddenly the person says, "I have changed my mind. I want to use another person." He gets angry. Americans don't do things that way. If you don't give them business today, they with smiles they do what? They walk away because they believe tomorrow you may come back to them and do what? And give them the business. And my brother from. Uh, from Abriba, he's, uh, he's angry, he's fuming, he's, he feels he deserves that, <laughs> he's entitled to that business. No, if you go, and the same thing we are doing in ministry, can you engage people? Can you have conversations in love? Can you really interact with people? And even, because you have your position, you know about God, but remember that the, the God of this world has blocked their eyes, and they have a certain position until there is a, a changeover. They will keep holding on to their position, but do you ever get angry and get, uh, you know, irritated at them and all that? And fight? No, you don't need to really do that. I pray the Lord will help us. I pray the Lord will cause us to get matured and get to evolve 
to real community leaders in the name of Jesus Christ. A, attitude problem, attitude problem. And D, discipleship problem. Yeah, we still have this issue where we get into our communities, we get the work done. The problem of follow-up remains a problem. How to follow up the people? You do all the hard work in the community. And pastor will bear, bear me witness. You know, we, we've had many, uh, we have many stains into our community. And you know, just getting into the community, being vocal, you don't keep quiet because they are vocal. You speak the word, every the marketplace, you speak the word, preach Jesus, talk about Jesus, engage people. I remember many years ago, we're there. In the campus environment, we're just there not too far. Engaging, I was speaking, talking about Jesus to, uh, to, to, to another person, not knowing a stone threw from me was a woman possessed of the devil. And while I was talking about Jesus, she dashed to, uh, to, to, to me where I was and came rolling at, uh, with, uh, with her eyes rolling at me with a seductive spirit and stepping, to the extent of stepping on my toes. And I looked and I said, yes. She said, I need help. I need help and I need help. I say, yes, indeed, you need help. And I will take you to where you will get that help. Do you know, I, uh, from the community, she ended up in the church. And uh, thank God for the man of God in the house here, by the anointing. You know, I've never really been part of deliverance ministry. That was the very first real deliverance ministry that I experienced. And the devil was being smoked out of that individual. And uh, at the end of the day, she gave her life to Christ. And she was totally delivered. That was from the community to the church. I pray the Lord. You don't need to clap. It's not. We need to reproduce more of these things. And these are testimonies of yesterday years. And I think I'm ready for the next level. Turn to your neighbor and say, are you ready for the next level? The other day, my pastor over there uh, took his members to the cruise. They went to cruise on the, on the sea. Cruise ship. That would not permit me to talk about that. They were cruising like Jesus. <laughs> Your members are not here, but I've told them to turn to you as a pastor and say, Pastor, get something done for us and take us out of boredom of Sunday, Sunday services. Ministry is very exciting. You know, worship services are place we place we come to worship God's spirit and truth. But if we are not exercising ourselves, you and you keep seeing the same faces every Sunday, you are going to get bored. But they refreshing thing about ministry is getting to see diverse faces. Ministry work is to see new faces Sunday after Sunday and then you come as nature and somebody's getting off and we trust God that they get retained and that we, we want to get to that fruitfulness again. We want to get to that vibrancy again where we are happy, we're excited as a result of association in our communities. We're able to get people to grow the church. May the Lord help us, give us understanding in Jesus' name. I am really out of time. Stipulations for effective community outreach for church growth. You know, John 4, 35, Jesus says, Say not ye there that, that there are yet four months, and then come at harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Say not is the antidote to do not. And do not is a short form of do nothing. So let us do something. And as you do something, the Lord will bless you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. You know, we're talking about stipulations for effective community outreach for church growth. Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world. And this world, some are under the bridge, some have come under the bridge. And in fact, some are under bodies. Uh, Jesus told us the very first message, go tell them, let my people go. That's the message for the community. We get into our community and say what? Let my people go. That's our message. We take it into the community. And with the backing of God, the Lord will help us. Now, conditions, stipulations, number one, there has to be self-awareness. Everybody says self-awareness. You have to be aware of your convictions and your calling. If you are not mature, you can go and be sitting with prostitutes. You know, you have to know who you are. You have to talk to your, to your neighbor and say, know who you are. If you don't have that maturity and that level of tolerance, <laughs> you, you better don't play with fire. Praise the Lord. You have to have a sense of empathy. Sense of empathy. You have to have a sense of adaptation and resilience. Never giving up. You have to have a sense of selflessness. A sense of focus. You have to be 
pastor told us, studious. You have to know your material. You know, not be moved by facial expressions of the crowd and uh, not get...